Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Now, in this course, we don't usually talk about individual viruses, but today is an exception. And today we're going to talk about HIV and AIDS, because this is really um, the virus infection of our generation. And the virus itself is amazing. So I want to try and convey that to you today. And let's start by um, showing you this first slide, which is an excerpt from a book. If you really want to learn more about the origin of AIDS and HIV, this is a great book by Jacques Pepin, The Origin of AIDS. And this is a quote from it. This tragedy, and he's referring to the AIDS pandemic, was facilitated or even caused by interventions, colonization, urbanization, and probably well-intentioned public health campaigns. So part of what I want to do today is explain to you what this means, along with understanding uh, the biology of this virus. Now this story begins in 1981 uh, in a report in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, a publication of the Centers for Disease Control. And they notice here a, an unusual outbreak, five cases of pneumocystis <coughs> pneumonia. Uh, five young men, all active homosexuals, were treated for biopsy-confirmed pneumocystis carinae pneumonia at three different hospitals in Los Angeles. Two of the patients died. And then in this report, there were five, the five case reports describing the evolution of the disease in these individuals. And notice here, this is unusual because pneumocystis pneumonia in the U.S. is almost exclusively limited to severely immunosuppressed patients. So if you have a good immune system, you're not going to get this. So just to have five cases at once uh, threw up a flag. And uh, they go on to talk about uh, the, these five cases in this article. But down here, I also want to point out their summary. All of the above observations suggest the possibility of a cellular immune dysfunction related to a common exposure that predisposes individuals to opportunistic infections. So these five men all had infections that you normally don't see. So this was the beginning of the AIDS pandemic. Eventually, there were additional clusters of pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, PCP, and Kaposi's sarcoma, a very rare skin cancer that we'll talk about a bit later. These were found in other urban centers. So the CDC established a case definition so that people could then start looking for this disease and figure out what was causing it. It was a very simple definition, either KS, Kaposi's sarcoma, or some kind of opportunistic infection like PCP or Candida or CMV uh, excretion that you don't normally see in healthy people. The disease was originally called GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency. It was thought to be an exclusively gay transmitted disease, which is, of course, totally wrong. But many people ignored it for many years until finally it was, it was called AIDS. And we'll talk about the name in a moment. And it was found to be transmitted at birth from mother to child and uh, heterosexually as well. Uh, the virus was first isolated in 1983 from the lymph node of a patient in France that had lymphadenopathy, swollen lymph nodes, uh, and other symptoms consistent with the case definition. A blood test was developed in 1984 uh, so that you could then take people with the case definition and see if they had virus in their blood and start to assemble evidence that the virus was causing the disease. And finally, EM, looking at EM of the virus itself and sequence analysis revealed that this new virus was a lentivirus, which was already known to be a group among the retroviruses. So we've talked quite a bit about retroviruses in this course. You know, there are these unusual viruses that have reverse transcriptase uh, in their life cycles. Now, just to put this in perspective, in the retrovirus family, Retrovirus is divided into a couple of subfamilies, two subfamilies, uh, in fact. And this subfamily has all the human retroviruses in it. Here are the lentiviruses, HIV 1 and 2. And there are many other animal lentiviruses as well. And then there are other human retroviruses in this family as well, uh, HCLV 1, 2, 3, and 4. And so this is what they look like. Remember, these are envelope viruses. 
They have a capsid within them. In the case of lentes, it's a little unusual. It's this uh, cone-shaped capsid, capsid with some kind of uh, sy symmetry about it. In it is the RNA. There are two pieces of RNA, as you know, for all these retroviruses. They have two copies of the genome. They have a reverse transcriptase and integrase inside the particle. And here is a map of the proviral DNA. That's the DNA integrated into the host cell. So you see it's got two LTRs on either side and all the coding region for the various proteins, GAG, Paul, and envelope. These are the ones we've talked about before, but the lentes are different. They have a lot of other proteins. You can see them here, VIF, VPR, TAT, VPU, REV. We've talked a little bit about REV in terms of splicing. And then it, of course, makes a variety of messenger RNAs. The genomic mRNA is unspliced, shown right here. And then all these other proteins are made from various uh, spliced mRNAs. Now, um, the, the lentiviruses were already known to exist. As I said, there are many other lentiviruses known. Uh, the lymphotropic viruses, human T lymphotropic viruses, one, two, three, and four, are a different genus in the retrovirus. They're distinct from the immunodeficiency viruses, which are HRV1 and 2. These are lentiviruses. As I said, uh, there are others. In fact, equine infectious anemia virus was isolated in the early 1900s. It causes immunodeficiency of horses. And you will see this plays a big role in understanding uh, where HIV came from. So AIDS, of course, stands for Acquired uh, Immunodeficiency Syndrome. And a syndrome is simply the occurrence together of a characteristic group or pattern of symptoms. So typically before you know what's causing a disease, you call it a syndrome. And in this case, after we have the etiology, the name has stuck. HIV is the etiological agent of epidemic AIDS. There is no doubt about this. Uh, there are many AIDS denialists out there. I get letters from them. I get emails every week telling me that why do I keep preaching that HIV causes AIDS? Well, we know for many reasons the epidemiology is incredibly powerful. And in hospitals, people have been inadvertently infected with needles, with, stuck with needles full of blood from AIDS patients, and they've been infected. So we know HIV causes AIDS because we haven't done an experiment, we, but we have observed uh, these kinds of infection. But of course, there's many other bits of evidence as well, and one of them, of course, is if you treat people with AIDS with an antiretroviral, they get better. In the U.S., uh, AIDS, HIV has killed more than 600,000 people, which is more than all the wars. Uh, in the 20th century. Right now, a million people are more infected in the U.S. A quarter of them don't know it, so they're going to spread it to someone else. 51,000 new infections in 2011. A lot of the men, some women, and half of them are in people, pretty young people. So this is very disturbing. And other countries, uh, particularly transmitted at childbirth. So let me show you some statistics. You don't need to remember any of these, but I want you to understand the impact of this virus on the world's population. So this is 2011, WHO and keeps these statistics. Number of people living with HIV, 34 million globally, broken down into adults, women. A lot of kids have AIDS. People newly infected in 2011, two and a half million newly infected people, one in 0.7 million deaths in 2011. And if you want to break it down by country to see who is suffering the most, it is certainly sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the adults and children living with HIV infection, 23 and a half million in sub-Saharan Africa. You can see Middle East and North Africa has, has a far less burden. Uh, ours is pretty high here as well. Another big area uh, is uh, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, adults and children newly infected in 2011. In the U.S. it was 51,000. Again, sub-Saharan Africa, 1.8 million people. And also South and Southeast Asia uh, carries a big burden. Adult and child deaths from AIDS, 21,000 North America. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 1.2 million. South Southeast Asia, 250,000. Children less than 15 years of old who are living uh, with HIV, 3.1 million in sub-Saharan Africa. If we don't treat them, they will die because HIV-1 within 10 or 15 years kills most of the people it infects. 
uh, children less than 15 years newly infected. We don't have a lot here in North America, but you see Sub-Saharan Africa, 300,000. South and Southeast Asia, 19,000. These are pretty serious numbers. Uh, deaths in children, uh, very few in North America, but 210,000. The future of countries, they're dying uh, from this infection. So the new HIV infections are shown here in blue. They peaked uh, in 1997. You can see 3.5 million, this is globally. And these are the AIDS-related deaths, which peaked a few years later. Both are slowly going down as we tell people how to modify their behavior so as not to transmit the virus. This is a sexually transmitted infection and can also be transmitted at birth and by uh, intravenous drug use. And we also have good antiretrovirals now. We'll talk about those in another lecture. We have over 25 uh, antiretrovirals that can treat this infection and make it work. Uh, so we have triple therapy. We give people three drugs at once to, re to reduce the number of mutations that cause uh, drug failure. Uh, and so this has slowed the pandemic in countries with money. And these drugs are just getting into poorer countries as we support uh, the purchase and distribution of those drugs. So here's a nice graph showing the number of people receiving uh, antiretroviral therapy in low and middle income countries from 20, 2002 to 2011. You can see 2002, uh, this is way past the peak of infections, and yet very few people in these countries have drugs. And this has slowly increased to a good level uh, uh, over the years in 2011, uh, but it's still not enough. We, and we have to, Western countries, of course, have to pay for much of this, and we have to step up. The Gates Foundation, for example, is doing a lot uh, in this area. But you can't cure this infection. It, it makes a provirus, which integrates into your genome. And the problem is it integrates into cells that live for a long time. So you can't clear the virus. You can only suppress it. You have to take the drugs your whole life. There's no vaccine yet. Many people are working on it. But you can't prevent infection uh, using a vaccine, which would be good. If we could prevent infection, we could probably eradicate it. But we don't have one yet. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Can't, and you can't stop taking your drugs because within infected individuals, the proviral DNAs are integrated into long-lived progenitor cells, memory cells that live a long time, as well as hematopoietic precursors, cells in your bone marrow that give rise to immune cells, they have latently incorporated DNA in them. They're not making virus, but the DNA is there, and periodically these cells mature and come out into the circulation. And if you stop taking your drugs, they will make virus and it will overtake you. You get drug resistance even with three, so you have to keep on, on the lookout for that. The drugs are expensive, and as a consequence, the disease is spreading uh, very rapidly, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So where did this virus come from? Clearly, it originated in Central Africa. We're talking about Cameroon, uh, Gabon, the Congo, Central African Republic and uh, the Democratic Re Republic of the Congo. Or the first studies in Africa in Zaire, so the, this country, DRC, used to be called Zaire, now it's DRC. Uh, the capital is now Kinshasa. And Rwanda, the capital is Kigali. Uh, this showed that AIDS was very common in these areas. The first studies after the virus was discovered uh, in the 80s, 90% of sex workers in these two uh, countries were already infected uh, with the virus by the 1980s. Testing of archival samples. So once you have cloned the viral genome, you can now look for viral sequences in samples that were frozen years ago for other purposes. And so this is what was done. And that showed that the virus was already present in the 60s and 70s at a couple of locations in Central Africa, again in this belt right here, but not in the West and not uh, in the East. And in particular, there's a, serum, a famous serum sample called ZR59. Uh, this is when the country was called Zaire, ZR 1959, from an adult male who was positive uh, for, HRV, for HIV-1. Uh, so this person wasn't living any longer, but the, sam the sample had been stored and it was shown to be positive. And then another sample from the DRC in 1960. These two samples differ by 12% in their nucleotide sequence. That is a lot for two viruses isolated a year apart. And this shows that in this area, 
probably in Kinshasa, which is the current capital of DRC. It used to be called Leopoldville. Probably, H clearly, HIV-1 was present in that area uh, in 1959 and 1960 and had already diversified extensively. So that means it spread probably many years before that. Now, we have to talk a little bit about the diversity of HIV. And this has been figured out, of course, by sequencing the genome. There are four groups of HIV-1. They're called M, N, O, and P. And these are based on sequence alignment of the genome. You sequence the genome, it takes about 20% difference to put you in a new group. So M and O differ by 20% nucleotide sequence. It's just an arbitrary setting. Uh, group N, 99% of all HIV infections have originated from group M HIV. Group O, which stands for outlier, less than 1% of infections is limited largely to Cameroon, uh, Gabon, and neighboring countries, but again, in the central part of Africa. Uh, group N, there have only been 13 cases identified in Cameroon, and two of group P, also in Cameroon. Each of these groups originated from a single transfer of a related virus from an animal to a human, and we'll talk about that. But keep in mind, each of the four groups is an independent transfer. So this has happened at least four times in the last 100 years, but probably many, many more times than that. Now, HIV-1 is further divided into subtypes. You can see A, B, C, D, F, G, H, J, K, and then CRFs are circulating recombinant forms. Uh, these are when people who are at high risk, sex workers, they get multiply infected, and those viruses recombine within them, and then they go on to spread because they are uh, very fit. So that's what happens with these CRFs. There's 48 recombinant forms identified so far. As far as we can tell, they all can cause AIDS, all of these subtypes. Um, some of those, there are a couple of differences. People infected with subtype D seem to die faster. We don't know why. And the shedding of subtype C in the female genital tract is higher than the other subtypes, and this may facilitate female to male transmission. Subtype C has spread like crazy in Africa, and this may be uh, part of the reason for that. So um, what you can, what we do is you, you assume that HIV evolves in one direction. You get infected with a virus, we call it a founder virus, and then it evolves in you, and as you spread it, it, it evolves as well. So if you look in a country or in a region at all the different subtypes, you can make a pretty good in, uh, assessment of where it came from and how it spread within the country. And this is because we can sequence isolates very quickly, and lots of them, and starting in the 90s, we're able to do that. So you could go into a country and look at all the diversity of subtypes and figure out exactly where they came from all over the world. It's really incredible. And clearly, Central Africa has the greatest diversity of subtypes than anywhere else in the world. And this makes sense because it originated there and it diversified there very early and then the diversification spread elsewhere from Africa. Um, now some subtypes are, are associated with specific regions uh, and this makes sense because if you think about it, let's say you get infected with a specific subtype. If you have a particular lifestyle that puts you at risk, if you are an intravenous drug user, you will pass it on to other intravenous drug users because you all share needles. So here's an example. Subtype B is found in 96% of white homosexuals in South Africa. It was brought there from the US uh, in the 80s, and it spread within that community because they interact with each other. Uh, subtype C, 81% of infections of black heterosexuals uh, in uh, else, elsewhere in Africa. So some of these are associated with specific groups, again, because you get infected with one virus, typically, and that starts to diversify in you and whoever you interact with. So here's a map to give you an idea of the distribution of subtypes. The most prevalent is C, 50%, and that's simply because it pervades, prevails in Africa. Uh, most of the infections in Africa are, are C. These pie charts show you the fraction of the different subtypes. So subtype C is blue, so you can see it predominates in Africa. Globally, it also is 48%, as I said before. And these are the other subtypes in the various circulating uh, recombinant forms globally and in each country. Uh, so you can see we have mainly one serotype in the US and uh, in Europe as well. 
Central Africa, the countries I enumerated earlier, right in here, has the greatest diversity. And again, if you, if you assume, and this is a correct assumption, that the virus starts with a single virus and then it evolves, that makes sense that it evolved in Africa and has the greatest diversity and has spread elsewhere. So what was the source uh, of HIV-1? In 1989, a related virus was isolated from a chimpanzee, and this was called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, and it's given a, sub, uh, a subscript here, CPZ for chimpanzee, and they're, they're SIVs of various uh, primate species. And since then, over 7,000 fecal samples from chimps uh, in Africa has, have been uh, examined for the presence of the virus. It turns out that you can find the virus in feces and urine. So a variety of groups went over and collected these, and this is a non-invasive way. This is the only acceptable way to study the chimp populations, many of which are protected from 90 different field sites. And here are, so there are um, two different genera of chimps, pan troglodytes and pan paniscus. Pan paniscus is also known as the bonobo. And then there are subtypes, subgenera of uh, PT, PT virus, Eliotti, troglodytes, and Schweinfurthi. And they are very graphically restricted. These chimpanzees do not move around. They can't swim. So if there's a river uh, around their area, that's where they stay. They don't tend to mix what, much with other chimp communities. You can see PT Schweinfurthi is located in a very specific part of Central Africa. Here is PT Troglodytes right here. So each of these circles is a sampling site where feces have been checked for SIV in chimps. And the yellow ones is where they got SIV. So you can see that not every site is infected. And in fact, only two kinds of chimp carry SIV, and that is PT Troglodytes and PT Schweinfurthi. And the troglodytes, uh, you can see, are the orange here. And those orange, uh, sorry, yellow, the yellow circles are where SIV positive uh, fecal samples were found. This is the origin uh, of HIV. Uh, PT Schweinfurthi over here is not the origin uh, of HIV. It's these chimps over here in the southern part of uh, Cameroon. So in chimps, this is a sexually transmitted infection. SIV in chimps is transmitted just like among humans. Sexual intercourse, mother to child, and possibly also chimps fight and they cut each other, could be transferred that way as well. The, tra the estimated transmission per coital act is 0.008 to 0.0015, and that's very similar to humans about one in a thousand uh, coital acts, it gives you uh, HIV infection. And in chimps, it's pathogenic. At one time, it was not thought to cause disease in chimps. But it's very clear now that chimps get immunodeficiency from SIV infection, and eventually they die. And in fact, this is having a negative impact on many chimp uh, populations. All right, so where did it come from? chimps into humans. So there are over 40 SIVs of various old world monkeys. So these guys over here are the old world monkeys, the mandrill, the mangabees, etc. These are old world monkeys and they're all infected with different kinds of SIV. And for the most part, these monkeys are fine. Uh, these, this infection has probably evolved for as long as the monkeys have been around. Chimps probably got SIV by eating one of these guys. In particular, the chimp virus, the PTT virus that, that has been studied there in Central Africa in the south of Cameroon, that is a recombinant of two SIVs from a Mona and a red-capped mangabe. So at some point, a ch you know, chimps are vegetarians, but occasionally they kill a monkey and they eat it. And so this transmitted SIV from an, a monkey where it was not pathogenic to a new host, a chimp, where it is now pathogenic. That probably happened a few hundred years ago, not, not very long ago in evolutionary time. And then the chimp passed it on to a human. We'll talk about how that happened in a moment. Uh, we think that, again, each group of, uh, of HIV is a separate transmission event from chimps to humans. So 
from chimps to human, the M and the N groups, possibly the O. We're not sure about that. Uh, and then uh, there has been another transfer of the P group and maybe the O. So the O is a bit uncertain. We don't have a lot of data from that, from gorillas. And somehow it, came, it went from a chimpanzee to a gorilla and then into people. Now, gorillas don't eat chimps, but at some point there must have been a confrontation. And it only takes one uh, somewhere between a chimp and a gorilla, and the gorilla got infected. So for somehow from a gorilla to the people, that caused the emergence of P and maybe the O uh, groups of SIV. So let's look at how this, the sequence analysis of um, HIVs can tell us where the viruses came from. Now, you have to remember, by now, we have sequenced many, many strains of not only HIV in Africa, but also SIV from the same locations. And you can see that the SIVs are so similar to the HIV. They, they had to have come there from there. But there are very precise uh, quantitative methods for looking at that. And that's phylogenetics. Phylogenetics is a way of we build trees to measure the genetic distance between organisms. And we compare sequences. We get the sequences of, the, of these genomes, and we compare them, and, and hopefully we do it in more than one gene so we have confidence that the alignment is correct. And we can see which viruses are related to each other and if they share a common ancestor. And so basically, uh, each division on the tree, which I'll show you, is a node. And then the ancestor uh, is the ancestor of all the viruses on the right uh, of the node. And eventually, you can work back to a root at the very left, which is presumably the ancestor or all the viruses on the same line of the tree. Now, we don't have the ancestors. We really have them. We just have contemporary viruses. So all we can say is, you know, an HIV and an SIV are related. They probably shared a common ancestor. And that's good enough to indicate that the transfer occurred from that animal. So let's look at this for some of these viruses. These are the human uh, HIVs of the, uh, the main groups, M, N, um, P, and O. So this is a phylogenetic tree of chimpanzee and gorilla SIVs. The sequences are aligned. And then the human HIV sequences are mixed in, and the analysis is done to see how they're related. So here, for, let's start with the PTT isolates, the pan troglodytes troglodytes isolates. You can see they're all, they're starting here. They're LB7, MB897, et cetera. There are a couple down here. And they go all the way down to here. And you can see that HIVM, all the ones in red, are very highly related to these. And they share a common ancestor. So here is one common ancestor between these uh, viruses and these human viruses. So here is one cross-species transfer. So there was a virus in a chimp a long time ago. This went on to continue replicating in chimps, and that's what we see today. But at the same time, it went into people and diversified. But you can tell the origin by looking at the sequence. Same way, you can see that the N group came from here as well. Uh, there's a common ancestor. Uh, and the, um, the, the gorilla transfer is shown here. These are gorilla strains. And the P strain is clearly related to them. So there is one transfer from the gorilla here. The O is. is not clear, as I said, whether it's gorilla or, uh, or chimpanzee. OK, and then um, Schweinfurthii is another subgenus sub of chimps. You can see it has their own viruses, but none of the human isolates cluster with them. So clearly, these were not the source of HIV. It's PTT and gorilla. So this is really a powerful way to say, yes, we can, we can know what animal this, this came from. Now, having all this sequence, you can also calculate roughly when the transfer arose, because we know that viruses mutate at a specific rate. They mutate a lot. So we can do back calculations. As long as we have enough isolates, we can say when was there a common ancestor in chimpanzees, for example. So as I said, there are four crossover events. That's from a chimp to a human giving rise to M, O, N, and P groups. Uh, M and O were probably in the first three decades of the 20th century, 1900, 1910, 20, 30. Sometime in there, we can't be more precise. For the purposes of today's discussion, we'll say 1921. N and P uh, happened more recently, but there are not enough data to pinpoint that. People are working on it. And the, the suggestion from this work is that Kinshasa, the current capital of DRC, was the epicenter 
uh, of the spread of these viruses because you can find all of these in that area and this is in fact uh, makes sense because Kinshasa is a city that exploded in terms of population in the early 1900s. So how did the virus get from a chimp to people? Well, we think it's by hunting chimpanzees. Uh, humans have always hunted chimps, not a lot, but they have always hunted chimps in, in Africa. So the idea is that someone was hunting a chimpanzee, they killed it, and then when they were dressing it in the field, they got cut and blood flowed into their wound. The chimp was viremic, the, the virus went into the human, and you know, we are 99% chimp, very similar environment and the virus was able to replicate. Uh, a number of interesting calculations have been made which suggest that in 1921, the number of people infected with SIV chimpanzee is less than 10. So less than 10 hunters and probably just one. You probably only need one, which would then give rise to the diversification in groups uh, that we see. This has probably happened as long as humans have been hunting chimps. It probably happened hundreds and hundreds of years before. So why, as long as the chimps had uh, SI, uh, SIV in them, which they acquired from monkeys, they were probably passing it on to people. So most of these infections probably died out. But the one in 1921 didn't. And that's really the question now. Why did this one spread from that initial? And many people feel it's just one hunter who had this virus in, in him, most likely. Why did it spread? Well, here we look at a little history. If you know the history of Africa towards the end of the 1800s, Europe decided that they wanted a piece of Africa. Uh, France and Germany and Belgium and other countries saw Africa as resource, and they just went and claimed territory. Now, Africa was, didn't have a lot of big population centers at the end of the 1800s. They were just loose communities with tribal leaders, and the Europeans would just walk in and lay claim to the land. Uh, and so they ended up establishing large population centers to build things like railroads and bridges. And they would take all the men from the villages and bring them into the city without their family. So that led to large scale prostitution in these big city centers. They also, the European countries also felt they had to make people in Africa healthier. So they started healthcare movements. So this was well intentioned but they didn't have enough needles. And back then there were no disposable re, uh, needles. So they reused needles and they ended up spreading infection from one person uh, to another. And we know this happens. A great example, which is well documented, Egypt at the turn of the 20th century, they underwent a huge campaign to cure schistosomiasis by injection. They ended up spreading hepatitis C virus in over half of the population by this. So we think this is why HIV spread from one infected hunter to a great deal of the African population because of this colonization, the establishment of large population centers, and the introduction of health care. So Leopoldville turns out to have been the biggest growing city in the region, uh, the capital of uh, DRC. Now it's called Kinshasa, but it's, it's, uh, it's right here. So this is DRC on the right here. And the population of Leopoldville, so it's called Kinshasa on this map. Here's the population in 1881, barely anything. And then you can see it's the, red, it's the round dot. It's exploding in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So again, people are coming into the region to, to work, prostitution, healthcare, and that all is spreading virus. So the idea is the cut hunter, maybe he came to Leopoldville and visited a brothel and then eventually he has to go to a, a sexually transmitted disease clinic which the Europeans set up because they knew there was a lot of prostitution and that would help spread the virus even more. Non-sterile syringes, uh, some of the prostitutes had a thousand clients a year. So you can imagine that this ha is an incredible amplifier. So that's how you can go from one cut hunter infected with SIV to lots of people infected. And before this colonization, we didn't have this expansion. There were no cities in Africa. So the, if a hunter got infected, you know, he might infect his family, and then it would end there. But these circumstances allowed for it to spread elsewhere. Now, there's a particularly interesting story uh, with Haiti in the Belgian Congo. Some of you may think that uh, HIV came to the US from Haiti, 
and this is a possibility, but how did it get to Haiti? So in, in the early 60s, uh, the Congo had enough of, of Belgian rule, and they revolted, and they kicked out uh, all the Belgians, including all the physicians. And then they said, well, oh, we don't have any doctors. We need doctors. So Haiti said, we'll send you some physicians. They spoke French, as they did in the Belgian Congo. So the physicians came, and they lived there for 10 years, and they got AIDS. They got HIV infection. They brought it back to Haiti, and from there probably spread uh, to the US. So lots of examples that we can actually track because of all those uh, subtypes. Now there's another HIV we have to talk about, that's HIV-2. It was isolated not too long after uh, HIV-1. It was isolated first in Guinea-Bissau, which uh, is right here. So it's in a very different part of Africa. This is Western Africa. And we're talking about uh, HIV-1 originating down here around Cameroon. And this is today still restricted to Western Africa, hasn't spread anywhere else. So obviously this isn't as good a virus in terms of spreading uh, as HIV-1. Uh, it's less virulent. You can live your whole life with infection and don't die of it. You die of something else. It's not very transmissible. And there's no mother to uh, infant spread. And uh, in fact, this is a crossover from a sooty mangabe into a human. So remember, the HIV ones are all from chimp or, or um, gorilla into human. S, uh, HIV 2 is from a sooty mangabe. And these are kept as pets in Western Africa. So you can imagine that this would be a good way uh, to transmit infection. Uh, this HIV-2 is declining in Western Africa. It's being replaced by HIV-1. All right, how is the virus transmitted? It is not terribly infectious. Uh, again, the transmission rate per coital event is about 1 in 1,000. Um, and it's not spread by respiratory, alimentary, or vector routes. It is a sexually transmitted disease, male-to-male -male sexual contact or heterosexual contact, uh, or by intravenous drug use. And at birth also, that's included in here. So you see the peak uh, in, the mid in the early 90s in the US. This is the incidence number of AIDS cases in the US by different uh, transmission routes. Uh, and up to 2003, where this graph goes, you see they're all uh, coming down to about the same rate. Globally, heterosexual transmission is by far the most prevalent means of transmission from either male to female or female to male. Uh, and uh, also occurring, here's the homosexual rate, intravenous drug use, blood transfusions, and then other, other unknown ways of transmitting it. So it's a very specific way of transmitting a virus. Now, we think that most of the transmission occurs by virus-infected cells. This is a survey of various uh, body fluids from HIV-infected individuals. And it shows you in how many cases they've gotten virus from these areas and how much virus. So on top, we have just uh, cell-free fluid. No, this is just looking for virus particles. So you can see plasma, semen, uh, vaginal and cervical secretions. These are the, the fluids that are believed to transmit infection. However, they don't have a lot of virus in them, and it's probably uh, virus-infected cells that actually transmit the infections. Uh, PBMCs uh, have a lot. A lot of them are positive for virus because that's where the virus likes to replicate in white blood cells. Uh, there are lots of cells in semen as well, as well as in vaginal cervical fluid. So it's probably a virus-infected cell that is transmitting infection uh, to the recipient. <clears throat> Here is an, an, an interesting graph of the probability of transmission. It was done in a study uh, in Uganda a while ago, and this is looking at the effect of having ulcerations caused by other sexually transmitted diseases. So these are in um, heterosexual HIV discordant couples. That means one of the, it's husband and wife, and one has HIV infection and the other doesn't. And this study was done just to follow them and see what happens to the second. So if you have no genital ulcer disease, this is the probability of transmission per 10,000 coital acts. And so you can see Depending on the viral load, if you have low viral load, the likelihood of transmitting is low, but people tend to have higher viral loads depending on where you are in the infection. Uh, so very early on, there's high viral load, and then very late, there's high viral load. So you can see the, uh, the frequency increases. So this is 0.001 probability, one in 1,000, right? Yeah, one in 1,000 coital acts, you can, you're likely to get uh, infected. If you have genital ulcer disease caused by another sexually transmitted infection, uh, herpes, for example, you, you substantially increase uh, the probability that you're going to get infected. 
Now we used to think this is because the ulcers are open and allow the virus to get in or the virus infected cell to get in more readily. But a couple of lectures ago I showed you the results of a study where we think that in fact at least for herpes causing genital ulcer disease, herpes infection is actually upregulating the receptors uh, for HIV and that's, that may be part of why the incidence goes up. Now it's very easy to inactivate HIV. You can all these ways, uh, air drying, heating, bleach, alcohol, low pH or high pH, the virus is dead, but it's spread sexually and by intravenous drug use. So those means of spread are totally innocuous to these uh, ways of inactivating the virus. And a long time ago, I told you that many viruses have evolved to avoid these extremes that are present in the environment, sunlight, UV rays, and so forth. And if you're transmitted by sex, you, you avoid all of this. So it's really evolved to be a very, uh, very clever pathogen. We talked about the receptors and co-receptors that this virus uses a long time ago in this course. The receptor used by HIV-1 is, and 2 is CD4, but it needs a co-receptor. It needs a chemokine receptor in addition to CD4 to allow virus entry uh, into cells. And Depending on what kind of co-receptor is used, we call the viruses T-cell tropic. They use the chemokine receptor CXCR4 or macrophage tropic, which use CCR5. And these are simply receptors for two different kinds of chemokines, and there are two kinds of HIV-1 virions that prefer one uh, or the other. And this, the importance of this will be obvious uh, in a moment on this slide. So when you first acquire HIV from someone, you have a primary HIV infection. Um, the virus enters you, and one of the first things it probably does is find a dendritic cell. Well, maybe the dendritic cell finds the virus, because that's their job, of course. We think that those initial cells infected are Langerhans cells, a very specific kind of dendritic cell in the mucosa. And we think those only express CCR5. So uh, unactivated Langerhans dendritic cells express only CCR5. And so that turns out to be, when, when you transmit virus to someone, that's the virus you transmit. The, the viruses that like to use CCR5, the so-called macrophage tropic strains. And that's really interesting because in late stage AIDS, you're full of T cell tropic strains, the strains that like to bind to the CXCR4 receptor. You have a few uh, macrophage tropic strains in your blood, and those are the ones that actually infect the person that you give the virus to. So there's a very big bottleneck, and only one virus makes it through. So um, and this happens probably um, in the dendritic cell. There's also a protein on the surface of dendritic cells called DC sign. And this is a protein that HIV attaches to. Most of the time that attachment does not lead to infection. But the, well, once the dendritic cell binds HIV, of course, the dendritic cell goes to the lymph node. And the lymph node is full of T cells, which is where the virus wants to replicate. So it's very evil. It, the DC brings it exactly where the virus uh, wants to be, to the lymph node. And there the virus finds lots of susceptible cells, CD4 positive cells with all the right co-receptors. It replicates, it, starts, it gives you a viremia. The virus spreads throughout your body and replicates in other CD4 positive cells. Uh, and that's the early part of the disease. Eventually your immune response kicks in and you control virus replication and you reach what's called a set point. You have a certain level of virus after six months that you will then have for 10 to 15 years. Um, and this primary infection, that is you acquire a virus, it replicates in you and disseminates by the blood 50 to 90 percent of these infections are symptomatic, so you have symptoms of the virus infection. Sometimes this looks like a flu-like illness. You can't even tell that you have uh, AIDS, the early stages of AIDS. Here are some of the symptoms. Look, fever, fatigue, melez, arthralgias, all interferon cause symptoms. Because the virus is multiplying, you're making an interferon response, you're getting all these nonspecific symptoms. Sometimes you have other symptoms, vomiting, diarrhea, swollen lymph nodes, pharyngitis, rash, etc. Um, this lasts about two weeks and then you get better and you go about your life and you think nothing has happened 
but the virus is replicating in you. One of the things that happens very early on is all the lymphoid tissue in your gut is destroyed by virus infection. So your gut, here's a, a picture inside of your intestine. It's lined with lymphoid cells, the pockets of lymphoid cells, sort of like lymph nodes of the intestine, right on the surface here. And the virus goes there, it's brought there by the blood and replicates in these cells. And here is a HIV positive individual after a couple of weeks, all these lymphoid collections are gone. So this is abnormal. These shouldn't, shouldn't be clean. There should be lymphoid cells on the wall, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, this is called. But this just shows you uh, what the virus does. It destroys all of these uh, cells. So here's the scheme or the, the, the progression of the disease. So we've talked about acquiring infection right here. We have, uh, here is HIV RNA in the blood. So we have that initial peak of virus replication. The inoculum replicates in various lymphoid tissues. And then it's controlled by your immune response and you reach this set point, which you have for years. There's a certain level of virus in the blood about, here it's about 100, 100 200 copies. And for years you're like that and you're generally well, but then you enter end stage uh, AIDS. You actually develop the symptoms of AIDS, which is uh, immunodeficiency. Uh, virus goes up again. All throughout this time, your numbers of CD4 positive T cells are declining because the virus is replicating them. And this happens to be a lytic virus. It kills those CD4 positive cells. And once you fall below a certain level, you can no longer respond to other infections like pneumocystis carinii and candida and, and CMV. So you get all these other infections and eventually you die of those. So the, the the course is very typical. There's an initial acute phase, a set point without symptoms. It's called the persistent state here, and then the development of AIDS, and finally death in about 10 to 15 years. So um, again, this is a summary. Active viral replication throughout the entire course of the disease. There are reservoirs of infection outside of the blood, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the CNS is another place where the virus replicates, the genital tract. And here's the amazing thing. You make at least 10 times 10 to the 9th virions every day, and those are destroyed. They turn over very quickly. So you have this huge turnover. So no wonder the virus varies so much. It's replicating like crazy within you. Half-life in the plasma of the virus is less than 6 hours and maybe 30 minutes. So you make viruses, and they're gone. You make them, and they're gone. And they're, they're altering and evolving uh, as, as we speak. So in the blood, uh, CD4 positive lymphocytes are infected, they produce virus, uh, these lymphocytes are killed, the virus goes on to infect new lymphocytes that your bone marrow is continually producing. You have an infection after all, so your bone marrow is cranking out CD4 positive lymphocytes. These are the helper cells, right, that help decide whether you're going to make antibody or CTLs. They're being infected and destroyed, but at the same time the virus is getting into other compartments where it latently infects cells that do not produce virus. So a lot of these latently infected memory cells, for example, they live for a long time uh, and they don't produce virus. So here, 145 day half-life on this cell. And then of course there are these multipotent hematopoietic progenitors in your bone marrow. They get infected too. They have a provirus integrated into their DNA. But they don't make virus. That provirus is there, it's quiet. But if you ever come off drug therapy, if you're on it, now those cells are eventually going to make virus again. So you can never get rid of this. You can't get rid of the infection. And that's the big problem here. Now I've described a typical course of uh, AIDS after HIV infection. That's typical progressor shown here in the upper left. You get infected, you have a burst of viremia, you have some symptoms, then you reach a set point for many years, you have clinical latency, that means no symptoms, and then you have late stage disease and development of AIDS and death. So here's your CD4 count, eventually you plummet, you get infections, you die. So you're dying of the opportunistic infections, not from what virus is directly doing to you. Uh, there are two other interesting uh, ways that the infection can go. One is a rapid progressor, where you have the primary infection, uh, but then very quickly, within a few years, it, it progresses to AIDS. The CD count drops very quickly, and you die within a couple of years, as opposed to 10 or 15. And we don't really understand uh, what regulates that. The one on the bottom is the really interesting one. These are non-progressors. These are people who get infected 
and they have virus in them. They have maybe that initial burst of virus, they, get a, they reach a set point, and then they stay at that set point forever. They make a low amount of virus, their CD4 count remains constant, and they never get sick. So these are obviously people we want to study because we want to know what's special about them and can we use that to help uh, other people who are infected. So these people who don't progress are called elite controllers. They're very rare. <clears throat> and these are individuals, as I said, who have normal CD4 counts, very low copies of RNA for many years. And you don't have to give them antiretrovirals. They can be fine without it. One in 300 infected persons. These people have an unusual MHC haplotype. So you know the MHC molecules are responsible for presenting antigens to CTLs and to B cells so that you can make an immune response, right? The problem with HIV is that as the virus replicates, it's always changing its sequence. So the peptide that's presented in MHC is always different, and most people can't accommodate those changes. So over time, you get bad at presenting uh, the changed peptides in the MHC molecule. These individuals have a very specific HLA type. It's called B57 and B27, which apparently can accommodate all these different peptides that the virus is throwing at. It can recognize any of them. And we talked about this on a podcast. I don't have time to go into it here. It's really interesting. They have apparently at birth this cool uh, HLA type that is selected so it can recognize whatever peptide the virus makes. And that's how, one of the reasons why they're able to cause disease, uh, control their disease. So again, this is associated with a good immune response and not with an attenuated virus that might have evolved uh, over time. So we're, people are trying to figure out how this could be used to make other people uh, control infection. It's not very easy. Now, this is what the virus does to your immune system. I've told you only that it infects CD4 positive T cells. And that alone is enough to really mess up your immune system. But these are all the other immune cell types that are affected by virus infection. It's basically all of them. Not only CD4s, but CD8s, monocytes, dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells, NK cells. I mean, it just, it just trashes your entire immune system. And in doing so, it's taking a long time. It's taking 10 to 15 years. So you are spreading the infection. So this is actually a, a brilliant evolutionary strategy. Eventually, the host is, is killed by other things, not by the virus directly. But it's managed to spread in all this time. So I just show you this to give you an example of the extensive immune dysfunction uh, that the virus causes. So clinical age is defined as less than 200 CD4 positive T cells per mil of blood should be normally much higher. Pro, uh, opportunistic infections, in, including protozoa, uh, bacterial, fungal, and viral infections that don't normally happen in healthy people with good immune responses. Uh, immune activation. All the T cells are activated all the time because there's virus around. And the virus seems to like that when the T cells are activated. It's associated with certain cancers, uh, including Kaposi's sarcoma, which is what pointed us to the original infection to begin with. And there's also the so-called neuroaids, neurological symptoms of various sorts that probably are a consequence of the virus replicating in the CNS. And it's very difficult to treat that because a lot of the drugs don't effectively get off, uh, get across that uh, blood-brain barrier. So here's an example of what happens in the CNS. Remember I told you that the CNS has got a nice blood-brain barrier that protects it from most virus infections, but some viruses can get in, and HIV is one of them. It can pr probably get through the endothelium or maybe be brought in by uh, an infected lymphocyte or macrophage. Gets into the CNS, can replicate uh, in astrocytes and oligodendrocytes and microglia. And when it does so, it leads to the production of uh, cytokines, which are toxic in the CNS, and they interfere with a CNS function. Here's just an example on the right of a microglia that's infected with HIV and all the cytokines and chemokines that it produces and the, tox the toxic effects that these have on CNS cells. It's really remarkable. <clears throat> Cancers, uh, HIV infection, 40% of infected individuals develop some sort of malignancy and you can understand how this would be because your immune system is very important for patrolling early stages of cancers. 
So when you're destroying that by HIV infection, tumors can now progress to stages where they weren't able to previously when your immune system was good. So you have no immune surveillance. And then all the cytokines that you keep making, cytokine, one of the effects of cytokines is to cause cells to divide. And when cells keep dividing, as we'll find out next time, that's a recipe for a tumor. So that's another reason why this happens. Now, one of the uh, cancers is Kaposi's sarcoma, which is picked up early in the AIDS epidemic. Uh, this was an old described disease. It is uh, described by a Hungarian physician, Mitch Kaposi, and that's what it looks like. It's a skin tumor. Uh, before AIDS, this was only found in old men in the Mediterranean, but um, now with HIV, we know that it occurs in 20% of HIV-infected men, 2% of HIV-infected women, and people who get transfusions can get it as well. It requires a herpes virus to also be present. Herpes virus 8 uh, is necessary for the development of uh, Kaposi's sarcoma. So presumably these, perhaps some of these pre-AIDS men already had HIV, and this was leading to uh, Kaposi's sarcoma. Couldn't have been the case in 1872, though. So can we make a vaccine? People are wor working on this very hard and we're spending a lot of money on it because you saw the numbers. And there have been lots of trials and most of them have failed. So this is an example of the antiviral immunity that occurs. You get that early viral load, your antiviral immunity kicks in and it regulates that, but it can't clear the infection. So why is that? Why is it that the virus keeps going on in the face of immunity and how can we deal with this? Well, here's the problem. You get infected with a with a strain or one type or subtype of HIV, got the purple glycoproteins here. You get infected, you get that burst of virus, and then after about two weeks or so, your body's making antibodies. So they're making the purple antibodies that recognize it. By the time those antibodies arise, the virus has changed. It has replicated so much, 10 to the ninth, 10 times 10 to the ninth particles a day, that it's mutated all of its epitopes that would interact with this antibody. So this antibody can't stop that virus. Okay, so you start making antibodies to the orange virus, and in a couple of weeks you have them, but the virus has now changed again. So this happens constantly. Apparently early on we can downregulate the virus, but we can never get rid of it because of this escape. And so the virus is constantly changing, so somehow a vaccine has to get around this. It has to be really broad and good at the beginning to prevent replication, otherwise the virus is just going to escape. So the vaccine really has to prevent probably greater than 99% of replication. Otherwise, the virus will just escape uh, the vaccine. Now, obviously, a vaccine also has to be broadly neutralizing. It should be able to neutralize all of the variants that arise. And so far, we haven't been able to do that. Every vaccine that's been tested is only effective against one subtype of HIV. I mean, people just want to get a vaccine to work, and then they'll move on to figuring out how to combine multiple subtypes. But there are some people who have been identified, about 20% 20, 20 of people with HIV infection, they make broadly neutralizing antibodies in their serum. These neutralize across the subtypes. So all the M subtypes, A, B, C, D, et cetera. These antibodies, which are present in 20% of people, they're a very small fraction of the total antibodies in the blood. These can neutralize many different strains and they apparently recognize conserved sequences on the envelope glycoprotein. So now the key is to try and make an antigen that will induce the formation of these antibodies. Just the past week there was an article about this uh, in the New York Times. And this is probably the best hope as long as we can figure out how to make the proper uh, antigen. So that's an antibody approach, but it's also clear that Cellular responses are important for controlling uh, HIV. Um, early on, as we control that first burst of replication, it's quite clear that CTLs are important for that. And in fact, in an animal model for SIV, you can infect macaques uh, with SIV and they develop AIDS. If you take, uh, well, the CTL development correlates uh, with protection. So for example, here's a macaque uh, infected uh, with virus, uh, you have that first burst of virus, it's, it's down-regulated, and the CTLs, the levels of antiviral CTL correlate with that control. If you remove the CTL from these animals, which you can do in a variety of ways and then infect them, 
the virus is never controlled. So CD8 cells, again, cytotoxic T lymphocytes are really important for controlling this infection. And there's some correlation in people who develop slower disease that their CTLs are partly responsible for that. So we have to figure out how to incorporate this uh, into a vaccine regimen. Now part of the problem is, as I said, as vi the CTLs of course are directed against viral peptides that are presented by the MHC molecules on antigen presenting cells. And those antigens change with time and therefore the CTLs can no longer recognize uh, the infected cells. So we have to try and figure out how to get around that. So this is the last slide I want to show you. This really summarizes it, which I think this virus is amazing. This virus started off in a chimp sometime around 1921. It went into one hunter somewhere in Central Africa, probably Cameroon. And from that one hunter, we helped, European colonization of Africa helped to spread it to the rest of Africa and the rest of the world. So that now we have 60 million infections and 25 million deaths. I find this just remarkable. This is why I do virology because of stuff like this. This is amazing. And think about it, this virus was incubating in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. We had no clue. We had no clue that it was there until 1981 when the disease finally broke above the surface and became uh, recognizable. So it just shows you what evolution can do with a virus and how many others are out there doing this at the same time. Now, I think we're not going to have any more SIV transfers because the chimp population is going way down, they're being hunted and they're being killed off by uh, SIV, but maybe there's some other virus uh, out there. And that's, that's why I study virology and why I think it's the coolest science uh, in the world. <laughs>